I want to uh, say shalom and welcome to the third lecture in the Ghetto Fighters House new international online series, Talking Memory. My name is Medin Shachar and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as an educator and as a guide. Uh, I first want to thank the Durfner Foundation for making this lecture series possible, allowing us to bring together such a diverse group of people from all over the world to learn from incredible speakers who are sharing their knowledge and experiences. And before we start some housekeeping, first of all, the lecture is being recorded and you will be able to see it within a few days on the Ghetto Fighters House YouTube channel. Uh, as you can see, we've put all participants on mute in order to avoid unwanted noise during our lecture. Uh, but you can use the chat box and you have been using the chat box to send questions throughout the lecture and I will present as many as possible at the end of the talk. And if possible, we will try to have any, an open mic session, Q&A session, letting participants directly ask their questions. And finally, I have posted and I will repost uh, the link to register for our next lecture on Sunday, September 13th with Marissa Fox, who will give a talk on my underground mother a daughter's epic search for her late mother's hidden Holocaust past. And today, we are honored, honored to uh, host Elizabeth Reinecke, who will give a talk on chasing portraits, a great granddaughter's quest for her lost art legacy. Elizabeth has a BA in rhetoric from Bates College and an MA in rhetoric and communication from UC Davis. Her master's thesis focused on children on uh, children of Holocaust survivors, specifically the Mouse Books by Art Spiegelman. She is also the great granddaughter of Polish Jewish artist Moshe Reinecke, and grew up with her great grandfather's paintings prominently displayed on the walls of her family home. She understood from an early age that the art connected her to a legacy from the old country, Poland. When she discovered that Moshe Reinecke's paintings were scattered and presumed lost after he and most of his family were murdered in the Holocaust, she began a journey that started over 20 years ago, undertaking a quest to reconstruct his life's work and to reconnect with her family's past. In 1999, she designed the original Moshe Reinecke Portrait of a Life in Art website. Afterwards, she began working on a documentary film, Chasing Portraits, which was filmed during a 10 year period between 2008 and 2018. In the interim, Reinecke wrote a book of the same name, published by Penguin Random House in 2016. And I'm sure that many of you here today uh, may have seen the film or have read the book. If you haven't, go <laughs> get the book, <laughs> go see the film. I can't see it here in Israel, but we're gonna find a solution to that, right, Elizabeth? Yeah. Yeah, but one more thing. As I finished reading uh, Elizabeth's book, which was literally yesterday, Shabbat, Saturday, I was taken aback by one paragraph in which she describes the quote-unquote overburdened bookshelf in her office with an additional pile of books on the floor, all dealing with the history of the Jewish people. A very familiar image indeed for people like us who deal with, uh, with history of the Jewish people in the Holocaust specifically. She writes that they are, quote, a reminder of the physical burden of memories the next generation must bear, unquote. So I want to say thank you, Elizabeth, uh, for sharing your story with us today, for passing on the memory from generation to generation. The floor is yours. Great. Well, it's lovely to be here. I mean, I'm in my office, but here with all of you. Um, I know that there are some friends and family here as well so i can't see all of you but thank you for being here because i know a lot of you have already seen the movie or read the book and know the story so it's it's delightful for you to come and hear more uh, hopefully there's some new new nuggets in here for those who've already heard some of the story um what i want to do is to show you some of my great grandfather's art, tell you a little bit of his story, tell you a bit about the Chasing Portraits project, and then open up for Q&A. So hopefully 30, 40 minutes, somewhere right in there. So this is my great grandfather, Moshe Reinecke, or as you say, in Polish, Renetsky. Um, he is a man that I, of course, did not know. Um, he died 
Uh, he died during the Second World War, long before I was born. Um, he was a prolific Warsaw-based artist who painted scenes of the Polish Jewish community and everyday life. He perished in Majdanek. This is a self-portrait held by the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. It was painted in 1931. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about his life in a minute. I just wanted to start there and, and give an introduction so that you have an image of him and, and his style in your head. The best way to start with the Chasing Portraits project is to have a better understanding of my family and the key players. I think that's always a little difficult when you're trying to understand somebody else's story and knowing who's who and how it all plays out. So this uh, family picture is useful for that. I am the little girl with the tights and the Mary Jane shoes in my mom's lap. It's in the early 1970s. My mother, um, Fern Reinecke, is the daughter of immigrants, although they came in the 1920s to the U.S. and lived in Minnesota. And then these are my, my father and his parents. And both my father and his parents are Holocaust survivors. Their story is one that I don't know in incredible detail, um, but what I do know is that they lived in Warsaw on false papers and they were incredibly lucky. They had access to money and resources and some people who were helpful during the war years. Um, they never were in concentration camps, although of course they had many close calls. What is interesting for me in telling this story about this photograph is a couple of things. One is that I am the daughter and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. So in other words, um, for those of you that use the terminology 2G and 3G, I am both which is sort of interesting in that most children of Holocaust survivors were born mostly right out of the DP camps. Um, and I, of course, was born much later. My father was born in 1936. So when the war ended, he was still a teenager and I wasn't born until the late 60s. So um, I am uh, sandwiched in between the second and third generation, but have had that kind of an interesting experience having um, both the daughter of a survivor and the granddaughter. The other thing that's interesting about this photograph is that you can see the two paintings behind me, and those are the works of my great-grandfather. And my great-grandfather was my Grandpa George's father. And I grew up with a significant number of my great-grandfather's paintings in my home and in my grandparents' home. I didn't ask a lot of questions about them when I was a kid. They were just always there, and I knew that they were from Poland um, and not a whole lot more about them. Um, this is another example of <laughs> not a great picture of me, but again, you know, you can see the painting behind me. Um, and just the idea that I grew up with these paintings, you know, I think that there's something special about that. I mean, at least there is for me. We often go to museums to see artwork and we get to spend a little bit of time with it, stand in front of it, buy a postcard and take it home with us. But living with art is a very different experience. You get to see it as you pack your bag to go to school. You get to share it with people who come to your home for dinner. Um, and it just, the characters in my great grandfather's paintings became characters in my own life. And the thing about that that helped me in this whole project is that I really began to recognize my great grandfather's style, to see the kinds of characters and people he was documenting and to really, understand from, I would argue, a visceral experience of knowing his art and understanding who he was. This is my grandpa George. Um, his Polish name was Jerzy. He Americanized it when he came to the States in 1949. And of course, the person who could have really told me about my great-grandfather Moshe was his son, my grandpa George. 
And unfortunately, that's not something that I set out to ask early on. You know, when you are a kid, you're usually not incredibly interested in your family's stories. You might hear smatterings of stories, but, but not a lot. And, and I just didn't ask a lot. Um, uh, I have over the years learned more of those stories and I was fortunate enough that well, it's a, a pro and a con. So my grandpa George died the year after I graduated from college. So I was about 22. I was living in Washington, D.C., and he was living in California. And I came home for the funeral. And after the funeral, my dad and mom and I went to pack up the things from his home. My grandparents by that point were divorced, and so he was living by himself and my father found in the trunk of my grandfather's car this collection of essays and vignettes that my grandpa George had been writing that none of us knew about. And the essays and vignettes were um, his recollection of the war years and his remembrances of his father before the war and a little bit about the paintings. And the thing that was incredibly profound for me was a sentence in the memoir that I found just by flipping through the pages. And basically what it said was that um, my grandfather was worried that, you know, he had experienced such hate and that such hate could um, happen again in the world and that he wanted um, to write his story so that his granddaughter Elizabeth would know the truth and not to be afraid of it. And that sentence sat with me and uh, was a weight on my shoulders for a really, really long time because I'm obviously not a Holocaust survivor, so I can't bear witness, but I began to realize that the survivors were going to die and that we have an obligation to tell their stories and to keep those memories alive. I think we see that now more than ever politically. And I think children of survivors and the Jewish community are working hard to tell those stories. Um, so when my, my grandpa George died and I was left with this um, obligation and responsibility, which I both felt honored and um, honestly stressed about because I didn't know exactly what to do, I, I had started graduate school. And so I began to be interested in how children of Holocaust survivors could tell the stories um, and insert themselves in a respectful way within Holocaust discourse. And that was why I was particularly interested in the Mouse books by Art Spiegelman. So let me go back. I told you at the beginning I introduced you to my great-grandfather and that I, I would tell you a little bit more about him. And I, I, so I'm, I'm going to do that with this painting. So again, this is a self-portrait, of, but of course it's not only a self-portrait. It is a scene of a Jewish wedding, um, and my great-grandfather has painted himself sort of in these wonderful Van Gogh-like swirls, and he is not actually looking at the wedding, he's looking at us. And to me, this is um, incredibly powerful, and, and I'll pause there and back up a little bit and tell you his story and tell you why I find it incredibly powerful. Uh, we believe that my great-grandfather was born in 1881, although I have to confess I have not been able to find uh, a birth certificate, and there have been mixed reports that it might have been a slightly different date, but anyway, around 1881. He was born in a small town east of Warsaw, and he eventually was moved with his family to uh, Shedlitza, which is um, a slightly bigger town than he had been born in. He was the 13th of 18 children, although only five survived various childhood illnesses, three boys and two girls. 
He had a traditional, excuse me, <clears throat> he had a traditional Jewish education. Um, he also attended a Russian middle school and he briefly attended the Warsaw Academy of Art. Um, we know for sure in the 1906-1907 school year, um, but I'm not sure if he had formal education beyond that. Um, we do know that he was very involved um, as a grown-up in the Polish Jewish art scene. He was involved in an organization that promoted Jewish artists um, and so certainly had mentors and, and people who influenced his style. Uh, but as far as formal education, I think it, it stopped in that one academic year and he was largely self-taught. So the reason I find this painting really profound and important is that my great-grandfather really had um, one foot in each world, a very religious world, which he had grown up in, and a much more secular world, which he chose to live in and to, um, and to have his own life. So he was compelled to draw the Jewish community, which he saw um, not so much disappearing, but assimilating, right? A lot of Jews from Eastern Europe were moving to the West um, and, and they were losing a lot of those um, practices and communities. And so he obviously was not painting to document because, you know, obviously he didn't know the Holocaust was coming, but he was documenting in a way that, um, that knew that, that that the world was changing a little bit. And what I find so interesting about this painting is that he has painted these classically Jewish looking figures to the left in the wedding scene, and yet he is wearing what we would describe as Western garb. Um, so he's clean shaven, he's wearing a jacket, you can see his tie, um, and he's looking right at us. I don't know what it is that he's trying to say, but as the great granddaughter, I find it incredibly powerful that he is, um, you know, he's staring right at us and that he's made these swirls and, and sort of this half-formed violinist that he's He's kind of separated himself, um, but, but clearly also included himself. I don't know whose wedding he's painting or if it is even of one of, um, you know, a family relationship, but obviously he, he wanted to document himself in it. Um, and this piece, as the, the note says, was done in 1918. So, um, you know, pretty early on in, in his career, but uh, to me so fascinating about his, um, his struggle to find his place within the Polish Jewish art community. So Moshe grew up in a family that um, his father was religious, but he also was uh, a businessman. He, my understanding is he had some real estate holdings um, and he, he allowed Moshe to paint, which is, as, you know, as you probably know, right, in Judaism, you're not supposed to paint. It's, um, it's, I'm blanking on the word, but it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, ah, why can't I think of the word today? <laughs> um, it's forbidden. Um, but he let him do it because he knew that it was something that was important to him. Uh, but as Moshe began to, to reach adulthood and, and got older, his father became deeply concerned about him, like fathers everywhere or parents everywhere, really. And that is, um, that's great. That's a really nice hobby, but how are you going to make a living at that? And those of you that have read the book, um, and I'll hold it up. Uh, there's a chapter in the book about, thanks Udine, um, there's a chapter in the book about my, uh, so Moshe's father, Abraham, takes Moshe to meet with another artist, and, and this actually is a, is a true story because the artist himself wrote in his own memoir about this, this meeting, um, and Moshe's father said, look at the way this artist is living, what kind of life is this, you're never going to make any money, and so Moshe's father came up with a brilliant solution, and he decided to marry him off. And so for Moshe, uh, 
I think, at least from my 21st century perspective, he kind of lucked out. Um, Moshe was married off to a woman named Perla, who is, this is a portrait of Perla. And Perla was from a family of some means, and they, her family had a history of running different shops and stores. I'm not exactly sure what kind, but, but they had those. And, um, and Moshe's father heard about another um, family who had started an art supply store and decided that that was a great idea for Moshe and Perla. So they bought this art supply store at 24 Krucha Street, which is in a part of Warsaw that is not particularly um, Jewish at that point. And they lived above, for a while they lived behind the store and then later they lived above it. And uh, he, Perla, I guess, supported his painting and so she would take care of the store and Moshe would go out in the world and paint. And so um, in my 21st century version, I think of her as an empowered woman who said, out, out, I'm going to take care of the store. And then she got to take care of it all by herself and make all the decisions. Of course, I have absolutely no idea if that's the case or not. But I do love this painting of her. Um, I, you know, I don't know precisely what all these things are in the store, but what fun to, to guess at what they are. So there's this as uh, I assume some sort of rocking horse down in the bottom left hand corner. I'm partial to this teddy bear figurine. And of course these masks are, um, you know, I'm so curious about what's going on with them. I don't know if they're imported from someplace um, or are things that people made in Warsaw. Anyway, I just, I love this painting because it's so vibrant and colorful and shows Perla sort of a, you know, it's almost like a photograph, a, a snapshot of a moment in her life in the store. And to me, that's, um, you know, that's a special moment because uh, she, while Perla did survive the war, um, and uh, actually she knew I was born, but I never met her. And so um, it, to me, it's a snapshot into seeing a little bit about my great grandmother. So Moshe and Perla had two children. Um, and the, this is a portrait of them. So my grandpa George Yerge is on the left and his sister Bronislava is on the right. Um, and unfortunately, Bronislava perished in, in the war years. Um, and I tell a little bit of what I know about that story in the book. Um, she, was, she was murdered in Warsaw. Um, she was married. She was a dentist, which is actually pretty phenomenal um, because the schools, of course, limited the number of Jews that could attend um, professional schooling and education, but she was a dentist and according to my grandpa George was quite successful at that and had her own office and it's my understanding that my great grandfather gifted her a number of paintings to hang in her waiting room because he knew that the patients who were there to see her were suffering from tooth pain and that his paintings would help make uh, them feel a little bit better while they were waiting to be taken care of. So I like to show these four paintings because they are, of course, all my great grandfather's works. Um, but what I think is really so interesting about them is that you could use the same words to describe them, and yet there are really four very different paintings. So, you know, you have um, these, these, they're all men, of course, and uh, one would presume they're in Talmudic study, and they're studying texts of some sort, of course. Uh, it's often very simple tables with some sort of tablecloth. Um, the men are often hunched over, their backs look so exhausted from having spent all day studying. The, uh, I guess you would call them light fixtures or, or maybe candelabras in, in almost all the pieces are very similar kinds of, of pieces, which to me are so um, uh, evocative of the era, I think would be the word that I would use. Okay, I need to take a quick break and take a sip of water. Hold on. I also love my great grandfather's color choices. The one in the upper left-hand corner isn't quite as vibrant, but the others really are. 
And what I find so interesting about my great grandfather's paintings, particularly the, the upper left and the lower right, is that he often painted scenes of people, but without um, incredibly, what am I trying to say, without uh, information that makes them very unique. So in other words, in the lower right, you see this gathering of men, but you couldn't say, oh, that one is, you know, Abraham. You, like, you couldn't identify who the people are. Um, and what I love about that, actually, is that it gives a sense of time and place without um, making it for about a singular person. So what's happened to me time and again at giving presentations in person is that people will often come up to me and say, my family was from Eastern Europe and we have no photographs of those times, but I know my family's story and this reminds me of my family. And I love that because it is a way to access that time in history without feeling like or with feeling like you're included versus if you're looking at a photograph of a very specific person, you know, if you're looking like at a Roman Vishniak photograph, well, it's, it's not you and it's not your relatives, but you could sort of maybe imagine yourself there. This, I feel like, gives you more space to do that. And so you can also really get a sense from here of the, the kinds of scenes that he documented. So you can see when I told you earlier in the self-portrait, you know, he clearly knew this world really well. He was really comfortable in it. Um, he could go in and be in these spaces and be part of them, um, but also leave and remember exactly what they were like to document them. My great-grandfather uh, painted his whole life, and that is true even in the early days of the Second World War. Um, this painting is titled Refugees, and we don't know precisely when it was painted, but we believe that um, it was very early days in the Second World War. My great-grandfather's building where their art supply store and the apartment was, was bombed in, in the early days of the war, and you know, obviously the city of Warsaw was severely damaged in the early days of the war and refugees were on the move really, really rapidly. So um, I love this painting because it is evocative of that sense of hurriedness, um, both probably in terms of how much time he had to actually sit down and, and make this piece, but also just in the sense of what it means to be a refugee. And I love the cross-section of humanity that he has captured here. So on the far left, you can see a man and he has some sort of russic he's carrying over his shoulder. Um, next to him is a woman and she seems to have some sort of basket and a, a, she's got a a handkerchief over her head, maybe she's older, um, and then there's a, a man with a, a beard and he, he's carrying a child, and then to the far right <clears throat> is someone in a wheelchair, and I'm never quite sure if it's an elderly person being pushed in the wheelchair or maybe if it's a young person with a disability in a wheelchair, but you know it's this sense of they're all together and they've all been um, displaced from their homes and and they need to move. Um, and so it's this. Uh, I mean, we've seen black and white footage, of course, of people being forced to relocate from the war years, and and this is, of course, the artistic interpretation of that experience. As you can see on the note from the bottom, this piece was donated to Yad Vashem in Israel. So I know a significant number of you are in Israel, and of course many others of you have visited. And the Yad Vashem campus is quite large. There is an art museum on the campus, and the, the original painting is in the art museum. And then they made a copy of the painting which exists in the history museum. Um, it's in the I think it's called uh, Beyond, uh, or Between Walls and Ghettos. I think that's what it's called. Um, and what is really particular, so I tell the whole story of, of how we gifted the painting in the book, and, and it's quite a story. Um, Yehuda Shendar, who was the curator there for quite a long time, is um, incredibly 
uh, articulate and persuasive. Um, but my, my family ultimately decided to donate the piece because we felt like it was the right place for it and that so many people, um, you know, really millions of people would see it. And what I really love about the Yad Vashem History Museum is the way it incorporates art into the exhibit so that the history is, um, of course, facts and material evidence, but it is also the artistic interpretation of those who were there. And um, those statements that artists can make are so unique and powerful in a way that, um, that, that maybe the, the history and the facts in and of themselves are, are not. And there's actually a great line in the documentary film where Yehudi Chendar says, um, you know, we, we art historians, we study the history, um, but historians don't always study the art. And it's been a real reminder to me of the importance of looking at what artists are saying in times of turmoil. So this is a photograph of the city of Warsaw um, after the war. It's actually a fascinating backstory that um, the, the Warsaw Rising Museum, which is a museum in Warsaw, took all this old footage and they had um, the technology to, to make it look 3D and it comes from this incredible movie. If you ever go to that museum, it's, it's really powerful. Um, but I show it to say that, you know, the city of Warsaw was incredibly destroyed. And the reason that I say that, let me back up a little bit. So my great grandfather was a really prolific artist. We're not sure of exactly how many paintings he made um, in the interwar year period. We think it's somewhere around 800. So that could be, you know, 672 or 854. I mean, I don't know. I don't have an exact list, um, but we know he's really prolific. And we know that in the early days of the war, he became concerned about protecting his art. And um, so what he did was he divided his collection into various packages and he distributed the art to friends and acquaintances in and around the city of Warsaw with the idea of whatever was happening would be over soon and he would return to collect it and his art collection would be whole once again. Um, unfortunately that's of course not what happened. Um, Moshe willingly went into the Warsaw ghetto and my grandpa George tried to get him out um, and Moshe said, no, if that's, you know, where my brothers and sisters are going, then that's where I'm going to go. And if it's death, so be it. Um, the brothers and sisters was really kind of a figurative term for, you know, the Jewish people. Um, and he, our understanding is that he was there up through the uprising and was eventually deported to Majdanek, um, where he perished. And so, um, so when my so my dad and his parents survived the war and at the end of the war you know of course this was the city and so uh, everybody presumed that you know not only had they lost so much family but that the paintings were gone as well so my dad and his I, i'm going to come back to the paintings in a minute so my dad and his parents survived the war and it's this crazy story where, uh, I'll try to keep it short, um, they eventually, my, my grandpa George ends up at the Bad Eibling DP camp in Germany. Um, he discovers from Red Cross list that my, my dad and my grandmother are elsewhere. He manages to borrow a car from the U.S. Uh, forces and go retrieve them. And they're at the DP camp for a while, and he's miserable, and he, he works for the U.S. allies for a while, and he says, you know, that the allied forces wanted everybody to go home because they, have, of course, had all these displaced people, and they didn't know where to put them and what how to deal with them. And my grandfather said, why would I go back to Poland? There's nothing there for me. And so my, my grandpa George managed to buy a car and drive to Italy. And they lived in Rome for a number of years. My dad was enrolled in a 
Jesuit boarding school. He had never gone to school in his entire life. He was, um, he was about nine when he started school and he said to his dad, I've never been to school and I don't speak Italian. And his dad said, learn it. And he did. He, uh, he studied with his classmates. He learned Italian. And by the time he left, he was fluent in Italian and, and caught up academically with his peer group. Um, and this photograph on the left shows um, my dad and his mother and my great grandmother Perla. Perla is the one on the right. Um, so she she obviously survived the war and she came she came to Italy. So this next picture is um, an interesting document. So Perla came to. Um, came to visit the family in Italy. It took her a while to discover that they had survived and that they were there, but, but she did find them. Um, and she wanted to, she, so after the war, she went, she went looking for surviving paintings and she found one bundle of paintings in Praga, which is on um, the, the side of the river, of the Viswa River, where the zoo is, and uh, was largely undamaged during the Second World War. And she found a package of paintings there, um, and she had to get permission from the Polish government to take them out of Poland. And that's what you're seeing on this document. It, it titles, um, it's, it numbers the paintings and gives titles, and, and aquarella is, is um, you know, watercolor. And then this is an official stamp from the Cult, the Polish Cultural Ministry saying that she has permission to take the paintings out of Poland. I'm often asked how she actually packaged them and brought them to Italy. I have no idea. I would assume in suitcases, but you know, I just, the honest truth is that I just don't know. So um, she brought the paintings that she had found to, to um, her son, my grandpa George, and um, and then uh, my dad and his parents eventually came to the United States in 1949. Um, my grandmother's family already had family in the States and they sponsored them. And um, so they arrived in 1949. And, um, and then we fast forward <laughs> many, many years to 2008. Um, so my, um, I grew up understanding that my great grandfather's paintings were important and documented a, a, a time in history that was gone um, from a place that, you know, I heard my dad and his parents speak Polish, but I never learned it and I, I certainly never visited Poland. Um, my dad and his parents had no interest at all in ever returning to Poland. And when I started, um, so I, I wrote my master's thesis about children of Holocaust survivors, and then I became interested in the paintings. I realized that I was not a survivor and could not uh, tell the, the Holocaust history myself, but I could tell the story of the paintings because they were survivors too. And so I began trying to understand what had happened to the artwork. Early on, I had to make a choice about whether or not I was going to be a claimant that is, in other words, when I discovered other people had my great-grandfather's paintings, was I going to sue them and fight for the return of them? Or was I going to act as a historian? In other words, I was going to say, I'm not going to sue you. You can keep the paintings, but I'd like to see them and know the story. Um, and I've really just condensed that whole argument because it's, it's a lot longer if you want to ask more about it in the Q&A, I can. Um, in 2008, I decided to start filming footage with my dad, and this is, um, this is my dad, and these are early photographs from the footage that we shot. And um, I'm going to kind of wrap it up here. I have a few more slides to show you. So uh, we started filming in 2008. We finished in, in 2018, so it took me 10 years to make the movie. We had our world premiere in Poland in 2018, which was incredibly profound. Um, there's a man in the movie that, and in the book, who uh, I had a really powerful emotional connection with um, and who was very sweet to me, and he came to the premiere. And then we've been lucky to screen uh, across the US and in Canada 
and um, we got picked up for distribution by First Run Features in New York. And I sometimes, you know, the story definitely is, has its sad moments. So I like to show these pictures of my dad smiling. <laughs> and uh, I often get asked, you know, how he's doing. He's doing well. He is um, proud to have been part of the film project and to be able to bring it to so many people and, and to share his great grandfather's work with so many others. That's been one of the really profound things about this experience. So there are, you know, there are a couple of places to learn more about the project. The one, of course, is the book, which is on the left, and the film. Um, and uh, my understanding is you're having a little bit of hard time seeing it in, in Israel. So the um, Ovid TV is a possibility. That's a subscription. Oh, they won't let you. Okay, so uh, you can buy a DVD from the distributor and they can ship to Poland. Also, uh, Yad Vashem has a copy and, and I don't know if you can view it there or how that would work out. Um, and it, it is possible that some Israeli libraries have the movie as well, I'm not entirely certain. Um, and then I'm on social media and if you wanna see more paintings um, or see the trailer for the film, you can visit chasingportraits.org, the URL that's at the bottom of the screen, and there are a lot more resources there. There are uh, newspaper articles that go back to the 1920s and 1930s about my great-grandfather, as well as more recent articles um, and reviews in the New York Times and uh, the LA Times about the film, and, and so everything in between. So I think I'm, <laughs> I'm <laughs> done there, so I will pause and... and uh, to take another sip of water and then hear your questions. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, yeah. I, I've waited for years. You know, I started connecting with you a few years ago. I missed your Jerusalem uh, showing screening, and I'm so happy that you uh, were able to, uh, to meet with us today. It really is, you really did it in a nutshell. There's so many things <laughs> that we yeah. can talk about, but there are a few questions. There's a very simple question. Someone asked, where are all the paintings now? At least, how many paintings do you know exist? How many did you find besides the ones that you had? And, and where are they? If you could give us like a, sh a little map of where they Absolutely. are. Absolutely, and I'm glad you asked that because like you said, there's so much and I can only squeeze <laughs> in so much and I always leave something out. So. My family has about 120 pieces, and uh, the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw has 52. They are the second largest known collector. The, um, uh, the National- How did they get the paintings? How did they get the paintings? So, uh, how did they get the paintings? They acquired them. Uh, the people who they acquired them from, I'm not quite clear how those people got the paintings. Um, so the Jewish mm -hmm. Historical Institute has um, documents and, and actually you can see them in the movie. They're index cards about this big and they have descriptions of the paintings and, and then they'll say the name of the person who they bought it from um, or gifted it. But those names, they're Polish names, um, so I'm not going to attempt to pronounce them, but uh, <laughs> a lot of those people, um, the names I'm told are as if, uh, you know, the, the classic sort of generic American name would be like Joe Smith. Um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of the names are like that, and we just don't have information about who they were, uh, you know, and even if I had a phone number, the phone number would be like, you know, from right after the war years. And it was just like I, the, the probability that I would find them and the, you know, they wouldn't be alive anymore. So it would be their children or grandchildren and they would have to know the story and it, you know, so it's hard to know. Um, and that sort of gets into the claimant historian question, which is, um, you know, my great-grandfather was a painter, and he did show his work, and he did sell pieces, and artists give pieces away, and they barter pieces, and they gift them to their friends, and so it's super hard to know um, what paintings my great-grandfather hid and belonged to us versus what other people legitimately bought and belonged to them, and, and so um, 
Yeah, so, okay, so, but back to the question. So, okay, so we have about 120. The Jewish Historical Institute has 52. The National Museum in Warsaw has two. Um, and then there are private collectors in um, Poland, Canada, France, and the U.S. that have pieces um, that I'm aware of. Um, and the story of the man in Canada who has a significant number of pieces at one point um, his father was actually a partisan fighter, uh, a Polish partisan fighter in the woods during the war. And after the war, he acquired a significant number of pieces and gave pieces away. And the family has no record of uh, who those pieces were gifted to um, or where they are. Uh, oh, and I also failed to mention um, that there are pieces in Israel. So there, um, so my family gifted the one to Yad Vashem, um, but there is a woman in Israel who is related to this man in Canada, um, and she has uh, pieces, and um, she will not let me come see them in person. So she has that sent- That is one of the questions, actually. Someone yeah. asked questions exactly about the, the Israeli uh, picture that you weren't able to see. Yeah. Um, so it's really unfortunate. Um, I, I struggle to understand her. I think that maybe, so maybe I should tell a little bit of the story for people that don't know. So, um, so, so there's this partisan fighter and then he has children and then there's a cousin and the cousin is in Israel and she was born in Poland, but, but made Aliyah, I don't know what year. And, um, and she has these pieces and I don't know if she just doesn't really understand the story or if she's embarrassed that maybe mm -hmm. she hasn't taken very good care of the paintings or maybe she's afraid that I will demand that she hand them over. Um, I think there are, I think there's social and cultural and generational misunderstandings going on. Um, and, and it's very unfortunate. So, um, I have seen photographs of the pieces she has, and I am confident they're my great grandfather's paintings, um, but she won't let me come see them in person. And the photographs I have are pretty lousy. They, uh, do you remember old school cameras that put the date, um, mm -hmm. stamped the date on the negative? So they have that, and then the, the paintings are behind glass, so I can see the reflection of the photographer in them. And so they're just, you know, they're not great quality photographs. So a second question, the same uh, person, uh, Juliette uh, Golden asks about the Polish collector that gave you the painting and you weren't sure if it was a copy or not. Yeah. And she wants to know, well, <laughs> did you discover anything afterwards? Yeah, I mean, I'm convinced it is not an original, um, but for me that piece is so power, it's not the piece, it's um, Edward's gift of it to me mm -hmm. that is so profound. It, it um, he understood that my family had had losses and he was trying in the only way that he could, because what else could he offer me um, but, to, but to gift it to me. And so that to me is, is really, really profound. But I'm, I'm really sure it's not an original piece. <laughs> Which also says something, that someone was already copycatting your grand grandfather. Um, yeah. Here's another an interesting question about, uh, and I was thinking about this myself, with this amazing story and journey of a family and putting back the pieces of the, the, your personal history. Someone is asking if uh, the paintings have been used in an educational way at all. I love that question. Um, yeah. Yes, but not, I mean, if it, if it is, um, I, I'm not really necessarily involved. Um, so uh, I have always thought that the paintings are a great entry point to talk about so many different things. So it could certainly be used to talk about the Holocaust, but of course it can be used to talk about Jewish life in Poland um, or just Jewish practices. Um, Jewish holidays. There, there's so many different ways, e even to just talk about Jewish artists and yeah. and what it means to be a Jewish artist and and who the influences are on his style. Um, 
And then the, the film has been used in some classrooms um, to discuss everything. I, I've actually participated in, a, there's a, a, a class on provenance research and I have been involved in, in that class a little bit. So there are a lot of different entry points and, and I would love for it to be used more in that way. Absolutely. Well, um, we still have a few minutes. If there's anybody else that wants to ask a question, um, the chat box is still open. I was saying that maybe we do like an open mic. So that sure. would actually depend on uh, Ron, if he could open the mics for everybody and then uh, we could let someone maybe ask a question, not have me do it. So is there anybody else that wants to ask a question? You can raise your hand. I don't see everybody, so that's a kind of a problem. <laughs> oh, okay, I see Catherine here. One sec. Yes, Catherine McKenzie. Thank you. Have you received any assistance from the major auction houses in acting as sort of sieves for when your great-grandfather's art might come up for sale? Mm. That is a really interesting question um, because uh, Sotheby's actually sold two of my great grandfather's paintings and they sold them um, long before I started on this project. And what is interesting is that, um, you know, I, I would say they were, they were helpful, um, maybe not in the way you might imagine, but they they did go to the buyer and say the great granddaughter would like to see the paintings are you willing to be in communication with her and um and the buyer agreed but then unfortunately um i don't know what happened he so he's actually in los angeles and uh won't is another person who won't let me come see the paintings but interestingly the the, there's a private collector in Poland uh, who used to live in New York, and he's the one that sold the two pieces. Um, and he had photographs of the paintings, and I actually managed to get those photographs as well as the catalog used to sell the paintings. Um, and so I've seen photographs of the paintings, but again, never seen them in person. So I would say, you know, if like, I mean, my great grandfather's paintings don't come up for sale often enough for me to have a super close relationship with the auction houses. But if anybody in the auction houses is doing their homework and Googles Reineke, they're gonna find me. Um, I, I think it would be really hard not to. So you know, hopefully uh, that would be the case. Thank you. Um, I see that Carolyn also has a question, so I will unmute you. Um, meanwhile, there is another question, someone who's read the book and seen the film, asking about the, um, the conflict between the two brothers, the one in Canada, the one in Poland, which story <laughs> is true? Have you ever found out? No. So, no. Um, yeah, I did, uh, Moshe Wertheim in Canada did come to the screening and uh, he called his brother after the screening and they, they laughed about it, but, you know, they mm. each insist that they have the right story. I don't, I don't really know who does. Okay. Um, Juan, I can't unmute Carolyn, uh, so I'm trying. I've just unmuted myself. Oh, Is it me? oh that's even better. <laughs> Great. Now everyone can unmute themselves. Great. Okay. Yes. Yeah, now I was the person that was asking about oh, education, right. <laughs> use of them. So yeah, just would you be happy for people to use your images or discuss with yes, you first? Yes, of course. I mean, I'm in the UK. So. Right. Um, okay, now I'm, everybody's unmuted. Yeah, I'll be right. But not everybody needs to unmute, just the person yeah, who's talking. Okay. Uh oh, okay. We'll try to help you. <laughs> Carolyn, yes, I would be delighted to have you use my great grandfather's paintings. You know, my only request is that you acknowledge so you know, who he was and that you, um, you know, provide if you're printing materials that you, you know, link back to us. Um, and, but yes, I'm happy to have you do that. Ooh. That sounds like a good idea. I like that idea too. 
Marilyn. How many of the okay. paintings do you think you've uncovered of the 800 plus that you think were created? Yeah, so um, a couple of hundred. So yeah, I mean, it's like 120, 50. Um, I mean, I think it's close to 200, maybe somewhere right in there. And then also, um, I don't know if Chuck Fishman is still on the call, but oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, if you read the book, so my great grandfather was um, a painter, but he also um, was involved in early um, early plastics and, and in sculpture work. So my family has a brooch, um, and then we know about this one piece. I don't know how well you can see it. Um, but Chuck Fishman took this photograph and it's in the movie. It's a wood, um, I would say it's more of an assemblage than a carving. Mm. Um, and, and so we found these other, the other pieces. The other funny way to answer that question is that it's amazing how many newspaper resources survived the war. And so I actually know about, um, I have photographs of paintings, but no knowledge of whether or not they survived the war. So I don't know if you count that as a, you know, a found painting, but it, to me, it, um, it helps round out the body of work, but I don't necessarily know if the painting itself still exists. Still here. Yes, here. Chuck, Hi, Chuck. Is, I see you guys together, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> Everyone should buy the book and see the movie. Absolutely buy the book. And if I can get the movie, <laughs> I'll be happy to see it for sure. Film, film yes. by, filmed by an, an Emmy Award winning documentary filmmaker, Swavimir Grunberg. Absolutely. Um, I see uh, Ralph Fulman. I want to open your, you can unmute yourself probably. You want to try from Canada? Good. Uh, any of these paintings um, at the uh, Kibbutz Museum? Not that I am no. aware of. I checked. No. <laughs> I would like to have a, it would ni be nice to have a thing. Somebody asked about a virtual uh, exhibition, maybe gathering all the paintings that you do know about and doing some sort of virtual so they would all be together in one place. Yeah, so I mean, if you go to chasingportraits.org, there is a link there for um, an online gallery that we have, and you can see a lot of the pieces there. Right, I put the link in the chat so people can yeah. go there. Okay, is there anybody else that wants to see there's something else here in the chat as well? Um, there's James Wald, would you like to open your mic and ask your question? Sure, hi, Elizabeth. <clears throat> you know, hi. Uh, something that occurred to me when I read your book and others is that a number of us have, I mean, everyone's interested in family history at some point, as you say, but the number of these really extended quests uh, intrigues me, you know, people who've gone on for years through the archives, through travel and so forth, trying to reconstruct these stories. And I wondered if it occurred to you that this is kind of a genre that's emerging in a certain type of Absolutely. literature, and whether it'd be worth bringing together others who do this for some kind of joint conversation or publication? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there's sort of two strands here. I think there are, uh, I mean, if you wanted to narrow it to just children of artists who are searching for their, their mm -hmm. own families, I'm trying to differentiate between, um, you know, like someone who collected art, but they weren't related to the artist versus children, grandchildren who are related to the artist. They're definitely a significant I mean, to me, I think a significant number of us. Um, I had I posted a blog about it years ago and, and try to keep track of those people. Um, but there are also definitely, you're right, a lot of stories, uh, both 2G and 3G, who have tracked down their stories and um, have both um, made movies and, and are writing books or have written books. And um, yeah, I think it's amazing that there there's so many and they continue to be published and that people continue to read them. It's great. Thanks. Is there anybody else who would like to open their mic, ask a question, make a comment? I have a question for Elizabeth. Uh, 
could you tell us how you make the decision not to pursue legal ends or to get ownership of the paintings and do something different from that? Yeah, and that is a super important question and, and kind of a complicated one. So mm -hmm. to be a successful claimant, you really have to have a lot of information and evidence on your side. You have to have lists or photographs that, you know, describe the painting, um, you know, tell its dimensions, what the subject matter is, what the medium is. Um, and those are all things that I, when I started this quest, I just didn't have. I mean, I could say anything that says Reineke on it. Um, I just, I didn't have that kind of information. Um, and the other problem that was pointed out super early to me by um, an organization in New York called the Holocaust Claims Processing Office was that my great-grandfather was the artist. And that makes it a lot harder because, um, you know, I don't have bills of sale because, he, you know, he didn't sell them to himself. Um, and like I said earlier, artists we do know that he tried to sell pieces. We, we actually have evidence of paintings with um, price tags on the back of them, as well as catalogs with prices in them, and newspaper articles about exhibits where he was selling works. And so we just, it's really hard to prove that somebody else didn't acquire something completely legitimately. Um, plus, the other super complicated fact is that Poland is, um, they don't have the best track record in dealing with restitution issues. And uh, that's probably just best left said that way. But if you've, if you've read anything about Poland and, and Holocaust era restitution issues, it's an uphill battle and with the current government is not any easier. And, um, you know, I mean, I think that we were kind of fortunate that we had a, and have a lot of pieces and, um, you know, even if I acquired more, even if rightfully they were ours, what exactly was I going to do with them? I'm already struggling with what happens next to the paintings. And so um, I decided to try to, I, I hoped that by people understanding that I was acting as a historian and not as a claimant, that people would be more willing to open their doors and to say, you know, they would be less afraid to say, hey, I have a painting you might be interested in knowing about, rather than fearing contacting me that I would sue them. Now, that was going to be my last question. What about the legacy from you to your boys and your family? You said you have over 120 pieces. What, yeah. what is going to happen? What are your thoughts? I, you know, I think about it a lot, and I don't really know. It's complicated. Um, if Another thing I haven't really had a chance to talk about here is that uh, when I've tried to do in-person exhibits, which now, of course, with COVID-19 seems crazy in itself for another reason, but um, the, the Holocaust museums have always said to me, that's fine art, and we don't do fine art. And the Jewish art museums say that's a Holocaust story and we don't do the Holocaust. Yeah, I see a couple of people rolling their eyes. I mean, yeah, that's how I feel. Um, so if, you know, the, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum has said they'd be delighted to take, I don't know if all, but some of my great grandfather's paintings, it will go in storage. It will not be exhibited. Um, and so you know, if, if scholars want access to it, they would certainly make that possible. Um, but, you know, is that really the fate that I want for them? I don't know. You gift something and it's not yours anymore. And you have to live with what the choices of whoever you gifted it to do with it. Um, but the responsibility of, of taking care of fine art is, is complex. Um, and I don't, you know, my kids are teenagers. I, when I was a teenager, I didn't want anything to do with it. So I don't know what they will or won't want to do. And, um, it's just a can I keep kicking down the road a little bit. I think that it really, your story really is a personification of what it means to have a personal uh, memory. Uh, and that's not even yours, actually. You're saying I'm three generations. I don't, I never knew my great grandfather. And, and the collective, where, where do they fit together? 
where do I say goodbye to a piece and where do I keep it and say, I do have these. It really is a struggle as we get further and further away from the actual event. What, what is that burden? You know, I'm looking at my books behind me, you know, my shelves are also kind of falling already. Um, that burden of, okay, what is our responsibility? And you really said it was a moral responsibility. I, I have to pass on this legacy. And it is not just about the Holocaust. It's about Jewish life beforehand. It's about this man's work of art. It really is an incredible story. And what you've done to uh, put the pieces back together as much as you could with all the sacrifice and the emotional turnovers, it really is an incredible, incredible uh, example of how we, are still searching for our past and putting pieces together and how much was really, really lost when uh, we lost our, our families and our culture. So yeah. I really thank you for that, Elizabeth, and for finally thank meeting you. Thank you for having me. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Really read the book and go see the movie because there's so much more. And the way you talk about it, the way you write about your experiences, like you can imagine in the movie, it's uh, even more, um, explicit uh this journey of yours it's written beautifully really is written thank beautifully you so i want to thank all our participants that came this evening and for your questions uh, i put in the chat once again a link to uh register for our next uh talk in two weeks and please share that with your friends uh, and invite them to come join our lecture series and I want to say good night, good morning, Laila <laughs> Tov, Bokir Tov, it depends on where you are. To everyone that was with us tonight, I want to thank Ron for helping. As well, I want to thank the survivors that joined us tonight. And I understand that part, your family members are also here. So I want to thank them also for being a part of this uh, talk this evening. And uh, we'll see everybody next time, hopefully. I just heard that, Helena. Oh, you did? Oh, wonderful. I just want to make a comment. I am also a survivor from Warsaw, and historically, it was fascinating. The lives that the, uh, certain Jews led in Warsaw before the war, nobody even knows about it. The cultural contributions that Jews have made to Poland in general, not only as far as Jewish life, but living in Poland. Well, and I think it's fascinating. Actually, many, many people do know about it, Helena. <laughs> I know, but it's not commonly known. I know, but not common. I think this is a wonderful presentation and very informative. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Who are they? I'm going to make myself back. back. I muted myself. I just wanted to say, Helena, that we have an exhibition in Israel at the Ghetto Fighters House about Jewish Warsaw. Yes. Uh, before the oh, war, right. during the war, and the uprising so absolutely and you're yeah many do know but it isn't well known and some people just don't want to look back at that history what that's then and they forget that they couldn't be where they are unless they had that history oh, so. exactly yeah exactly well, thank you myself, so. thank you a wonderful presentation enjoyed it wonderful. a lot thank you for coming what an honor <laughs> my pleasure Very good. See you next time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for coming again. My pleasure. Take care. Bye. <laughs>
actually let them go and stay with the private collections or the museums or whatever. Not, not very, not, not easy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you too. Christina, thank you for coming again. I'm so glad. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I look forward to seeing you again. Great. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully okay, <everybody>. in January. <laughs> yeah, I hope. <laughs> well, I'm going to end our meeting. And thank you again for coming. And I hope to see you again in two weeks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.